1966, Joan Margaret Myring was a married mother of two young children living in Blackpool. On the 8th of July, she reported her son had slipped in the bath and was unconscious. When emergency services got to the address, they found both children unresponsive. The children were rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, any medical intervention was too late, and both children were declared dead. But what really happened that fateful day? Hi everyone, and welcome to episode one of the Students' Verdict podcast. Thank you so, so much for being here. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Emily. This podcast will cover a wide range of interesting true crime cases that will include historical cases, which I have a personal interest in, miscarriages of justice, missing persons cases, um, cold cases and alike. Please follow us on Instagram at the student verdict blog and on Twitter at student verdict. Resources used in this episode will always be linked in the show notes. Now on to today's episode. Today begins with Joan Margaret Coop, as she was formerly known. Joan Margaret Coop was born in Blackpool on the 12th of March 1939 and she was one of five children. Her parents separated when she was young and her mother tragically passed away a few years later. Joan was placed in a convent where she received her education. She remained here until she was 15 years old, following which she left the convent and moved in with her grandmother. Joan attended a nursing course, however, During her second year of studies, she was admitted as a patient to Lancaster Moor Hospital, formerly known as the Lancaster Lunatic Asylum. This would be the first of a number of admissions to Lancaster Moor Hospital for Joan Coop. Following her admission on the 1st of March 1956, she was then discharged and went to live with her grandmother. She also secured a job on a farm. She remained employed until September 1957, when she went back to Lancaster Moor Hospital. She was discharged again in June 1958, following which she returned to her former residence and obtained work with a local market gardener. She remained employed until September 1960, when she was admitted to Lancaster Moor Hospital for a third time. She was discharged in December 1960 and continued with her employment for 12 months before remaining at home. Joan married Robert Myring in March 1963. After their marriage, the couple moved to 8 Rough Hayes Lane, Blackpool. Joan and Robert would go on to have two children together, Stephen Robert Myring, born on the 23rd of June 1964, and Gillian Edith Myring, born on the 18th of September 1965. To everyone who knew them, they were a seemingly ordinary family. Before we get into the day of the incident, I'd like us to have a look at the events which took place the day before. According to the witness statement of Mary Cunningham, Joan's grandmother and Stephen and Gillian's great-grandmother, on the 7th of July 1966, Joan went over to her grandmother's house on Lindsay Avenue with the children. She then went out, leaving Gillian and Stephen with their great-grandmother. Mary was cutting dead roses in the garden whilst Gillian was in her pram in the sunshine. Stephen was also in the garden. Mary had tied a piece of string around his waist to stop him moving too far which, I'm going to be honest, I've not heard of that technique before, but there we go. As Mary looked up to check on her great-grandchildren, she noticed that Stephen was feeding rose petals to Gillian. Mary rushed over, and when she got to Stephen, the rose petals were sticky. He also had a small brown bottle in his hand. She cleaned out the girl's mouth and cleaned Stephen's face and hands. Gillian was shivering, so Mary made her a bottle. The little girl drank it and went to sleep. Joan came and picked the children up between 7 and 7.30pm that evening. Both children seemed to be alright at this time. Mary would not have thought twice about letting the children return home with their mother. She had no cause for concern. She could not have known that this would be the last time she would see her great-grandchildren alive. We're now going to discuss the events which took place on the day of the incident, that being the 8th of July 1966. According to Mary Cunningham's witness statement, between 1 and 1.10pm, Joan burst into Mary's home. Mary described Joan as being red in the face, as if she'd been running. Joan shouted, quote, Stephen has fallen in the bath and I can't get him round. He's gone cold like my mother. 
Mary told Joan to phone the ambulance, which she did. Joan also spoke to Mr Davies, an inspector in Blackpool Police Force who lived a few houses away, and the three of them went to 8 Rough Hayes Lane. When they arrived, a police officer, PC John Hilton, was already outside the address. PC Hilton and Joan made their way to the back door of the property which was unlocked. The couple made their way through the kitchen and up the stairs to the back bedroom. When Mary made her way into the house, she found Stephen in the back bedroom, wrapped in a blanket, lying on the double bed. The boy was unresponsive, and as she tried to bring him round, Mary noticed soapy water coming from the boy's mouth. She turned him over and more soapy water came out. PC Hilton noted that the boy's arms were taking on a mottled appearance, and Inspector Davies commented that it appeared to him that the boy was quite dead. When the ambulance attendants took the boy away, the inspector noticed a wet stain on the mattress near to where the boy's head had been. Inspector Davies was informed that the girl, Gillian, was in the front bedroom. As he walked in, he saw a large double bed in the centre of the room, and on the right-hand side of the bed was a small carry cot. Gillian was lying in the cot on her left side wearing a vest and a soiled nappy. There was also a bottle by her face. Joan came in, and as she picked Gillian up, PC Hilton noted that the girl made a gurgling, gasping sound. There was moisture on the child's face and on her hair on the left side. Moisture could be found on the carry cot underneath where the child had been lying. PC Hilton attempted to revive Gillian through mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and one of the ambulance attendants gave her oxygen, but her condition did not change. Both children were then taken to hospital. As part of the investigation, Inspector Davies examined the bath at 8 Rough Hayes Lane, after Joan had claimed that her son had slipped. The bath did not contain any water, but there were particles of moisture. There was no soap in the bath, but there was some in the wash basin to the right-hand side. He then contacted Joan's husband, Robert Myring, and took him to Victoria Hospital. Dr Suresh Chowdhury, a medical practitioner, was on duty at 1.45pm at Victoria Hospital when the Myring children arrived by ambulance. Staff at the hospital attempted cardiac massage on Stephen. The doctor noted that froth was still coming out of the boy's mouth and realised that there were no signs of life. A nurse was also trying cardiac massage on Gillian. Dr Chowdhury took over and although there was no froth as with Stephen, it was clear that the little girl was dead too. Now before we get into the post-mortem, I would like to preface this by saying that there is a lot of medical jargon in this section and I am far from medically trained, although fun fact, I am a qualified first aider. Um, but I apologise if I pronounce any terms incorrectly. Dr John Banstead, a home office pathologist and registered medical practitioner, conducted the post-mortem on Gillian and Stephen Myring. The post-mortem on Stephen started at 7.30pm on the 8th of July 1966. The boy was 2 feet 10 inches in height. Dr Banstead noted old scars present on the back of the right upper arm, on the right side of the small of the back, and above the right buttock. Froth exuded from the boy's mouth and the end of his tongue was bitten. Rigor mortis was fully developed with dark post-mortem lividity present on the back. According to Dr Banstead's witness statement, the undersurface of the scalp showed five bruises, the brain itself was bloodless and the windpipe contained watery froth. Stephen's lungs filled his chest and were frothing and bloodless. Dr Banstead concluded that the cause of death in Stephen's case was drowning in water. Dr Banstead began his examination of Gillian Myring at 9pm on the 8th of July 1966. She was 2 feet 4 inches in height. Dr Banstead noted that she had slight nappy rash and small scratches were present on the nape and on the right side of the neck. Rigor mortis was fully developed and there was dark post-mortem staining present on the little girl's back. Gillian's lungs were contracted and showed collapse of the posterior part. The lung substance was congested and the surfaces showed scanty pinpoint hemorrhages. The stomach contained a small quantity of semi-solid residue and both the stomach and the intestines emitted a pungent odour. Dr Banstead was unable to determine the cause of Gillian's death, but he was satisfied that she had not died from natural causes. He concluded that the cause of death was poisoning by Malathion-60. Malathion-60 is an insecticide. 
Dr. Banstead researched cases where the insecticide malathion had been ingested and found that symptoms occurred within two hours of ingestion or less. In one case, symptoms were known to have occurred within three hours. Even though treatment was given, in two cases, death still occurred. The main symptom attributable to pure malathion is paralysis. Dr. George Manning, a registered medical practitioner and consultant pathologist, reviewed Dr. Banstead's report and agreed that Stephen's collapse in the bath was consistent with having been overcome by the ingestion of malathion 60. Cholinesterase is a substance which, in very simple terms, allows nerves to work. Malathion 60 destroys cholinesterase and the nerves then cease to work. The result of this? Paralysis. Having read the evidence of the incident in Mary's garden where Stephen was feeding rose petals to Gilliam, Dr Manning concluded that contamination from this incident could not have had anything to do with their deaths because symptoms would have been seen within a shorter time, certainly within two hours. To quote Dr Manning, all the indications are that the two children ingested the Malathion 60 after 8am on the 8th of July 1966. Dr John Mullen, a part of the Home Office Forensic Science Lab, conducted the analysis on the exhibits collected as part of the police investigation. An 8-ounce camp coffee bottle collected from 8 Rough Hayes Lane contained 65 millilitres of Malathion 60. Detergent was also present, giving a liquid of milky appearance. Eric Hargreaves confirmed that there were no decipherable fingerprints of either child on the bottle. No traces of Malathion 60 were found in any of the feeding bottles or on the teaspoon or bedclothes. However, there was evidence of Malathion 60 on the neck of Gillian's nightdress. Dr Mullen found Malathion in Gillian's intestines to the extent of 150 to 200 milligrams. That's approximately a quarter of a teaspoonful, so quite a significant amount. Traces were found in her other organs as well, including her stomach, liver, kidneys and part of the brain. Cholinesterase activity was completely inhibited in Gillian. In Stephen's body, Dr Mullen found approximately 15 milligrams of malathion in the intestines, and although the cholinesterase was diminished, it was not completely inhibited. I'd like to discuss the children's father now. Um, I know we haven't talked about him too much. You may be wondering where he was on the day that his children died. A colleague of Robert's, Robert Garrett, who I'll be referring to as Garrett to avoid confusion, was also a gardener employed by the Parks Department and had been working with Robert on the 8th of July 1966. Garrett first saw Robert at 8am when he arrived at the yard. Robert went for lunch at 12 and was back from lunch at 1pm. Robert and Garrett continued to work together until he left later that afternoon. Sarah Myring, Robert's mother, confirmed that her son would come to her house for lunch in the week. On the 8th of July, he arrived at her house for lunch at 12.10pm, arriving by bicycle. He then left between 12.40 and 12.45pm. So what of the children's mother? Kathleen Helm, a registered medical practitioner, had known Joan since she was a patient in 1954. On the 1st of March 1956, Joan went to Lancaster Moor Hospital as a voluntary patient. Following examinations and assessments, Joan was diagnosed as having schizophrenia. She was treated with modified insulin and was discharged on the 28th of June 1956 with a recommendation that she attend a psychiatric clinic. On the 24th of September 1957, Joan again went back to Lancaster Moor Hospital as a voluntary patient, where she received electroconvulsive therapy and deep insulin coma therapy. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is done under general anaesthesia. It involves passing small electric currents through the brain, which triggers a brief seizure. ECT causes changes in the brain's chemistry that can, in some cases, reverse symptoms of certain mental health conditions. Insulin coma therapy, also referred to as insulin shock therapy, involved injecting patients with large doses of insulin in order to produce daily comas over several weeks. This treatment was used mainly for the treatment of schizophrenia in the 1940s and 50s before falling out of favour and being replaced by neuroleptic drugs. Following her treatment, Joan was later discharged in June 1958. 
On the 21st of September 1960, Joan was seen at home by a psychiatrist and was immediately readmitted to Lancaster Moor Hospital. The reason for this decision is unknown. During this stay, she again received ECT treatment and was given Melaril tablets, a type of antipsychotic drug. Joan was discharged from hospital in December 1960. Helm confirmed in her statement that Joan had continued to take her tablets up to the present time. Helm also commented that when Joan got married, she had been worried about her having children because of her mental condition. But, as Joan and Robert were of the Roman Catholic religion, birth control was not possible. Helm remarked that Joan had been, and I quote, mentally disturbed for the past 10 years. Sheila Rowe, a health visitor and state registered nurse, had known Joan Myring since the 14th of September 1964, when she started visiting the Myring home in the course of her duties. In March 1966, Joan spoke with Nurse Rowe. Rowe recalled that Joan was worried about her children and had been finding them hard to cope with. According to Rowe's witness statement, Joan had said that she thought the children were coming between her and her husband, and that her husband thought that she wasn't looking after them properly. In June 1966, Joan confided that she thought if she could get away for a week or a fortnight on her own without the children, she would feel much better. Joan had also expressed concern that her children might be taken away from her and that she would be sent back to Lancaster Moor Hospital. After the deaths of her children, Joan did end up back in hospital. On the 14th of November 1966, at approximately 8.45am, DC Patricia Buck accompanied DS Gray and DI Sanders to B Ward at Lancaster Moor Hospital. DI Sanders informed Joan that they were taking her into custody, charged with the murder of her two children. She was also charged with a third offence of administering a destructive thing to Stephen, thereby to endanger his life. She was cautioned for the offences and made no significant reply. However, at 9.33am, when DC Buck and Joan were waiting in the sergeant's office for Joan's solicitor to arrive, she started talking. According to DC Buck's witness statement, Joan, seemingly out of the blue, stated, All I've got to say is, I did it. DC Buck went and told Inspector Sanders immediately. When DC Buck returned, Joan said, I've made notes in here indicating towards a small diary which was seized as an exhibit. Joan repeated herself once more, I can only say I did it. DC Buck made no reply but went and told the inspector once again. So what of the diary? Well, it was a Catholic diary for 1964, and on the 20th of December there was an entry saying, and I quote, Stephen and Gillian died, 8th of July, 1966. Joan was first interviewed by police at 3.15pm on the 8th of July 1966. When asked what had happened to Stephen, Joan explained that at 12.45pm she had run a bath for Stephen. Once the bath water had cooled down, she put him in. Leaving the boy in the bath, Joan went and got a clean nappy for him. She cannot have been gone long, but it was during this time that Joan said Stephen slipped. She heard a noise, and when she got to him, he was laid full length face down in the water, and he was frothing at the mouth. Police asked Joan what she did when she found Stephen in distress. Joan explained that she pulled him up out of the bath and let the plug out. She explained how she tried to wipe him first, and then held him in a towel whilst patting his back, but he continued to froth at the mouth. She went and got a clean sheet, but did not think to keep patting his back thinking he was dead. Panicking, she then made the decision to go to her grandmother's to ask what she should do next. She recalled that by this time, Stephen's body was cold. Officers then began questioning Joan about Gillian, asking whether she had given her daughter the bottle that was found in the cot. Joan confirmed that she had given Gillian a bottle of milk at 10am, but when Gillian continued to cry, she gave her a drop of cold water. She then left her with a bottle while she bathed Stephen. Now you may be wondering, as I did, why Joan went to the effort of going all the way to her grandmother's house, and we will be discussing the journey later, rather than making the call herself, or going to a next-door neighbour's house, which might have saved her a lot of valuable time. 
while officers put this question to Joan, who explained that when Stephen had had an accident before, she'd gone to a neighbour who told her to ring the doctor. This neighbour was unfortunately on holiday and the other two neighbours were out shopping. As for making a call herself, it is suggested that the Myrings did not have a phone in their home. When asked about whether there was somewhere nearby where she could have made the call, Joan remarked that it would have been a 10 minute trot and she didn't know if the phone box would be available. Joan Myring was interviewed by police for a second time at 3.15pm on the 22nd of July 1966. This time, Joan had her solicitor, Mr Jackson, present. Officers began the interview by asking Joan how her children's health had been on the morning that they had died, to which Joan confirmed that both children were fit and had not been suffering with any illnesses. In the interview, an officer stated that a bottle had been found in the pantry at 8 Rough Hayes Lane. It was a camp coffee bottle which contained the insecticide Malathion. Robert Myring had previously informed police that Joan was aware of what was in the bottle, as he had told her. Joan explained to police that her husband had told her it was an insecticide to kill greenfly, but that she didn't know the name of it. Her husband had told her to keep it on the top shelf, out of the way of the children. The shelf was too high for her to reach, so she had never touched it. Police were quick to jump on this comment. You've never touched it, never at any time? Joan clarified that a couple of weeks before the incident, they had got the insecticide down once to do the garden, but they didn't end up using it because it was raining, and so they put the bottle back on the top shelf near the cooking salt. So how did this substance get into the children? Joan explained, and I quote, I don't know. I'm not wanting to kill the babies. I wouldn't try to do away with them. I love them. I can't. You're asking me questions I don't know how to answer. I don't know. Joan agreed with officers that the children could not have got the Malathian themselves as the shelf was too high. However, she could not explain how the substance had got into the children's bodies. As part of the police investigation, it was revealed by Robert Myring that one of the baby bottles was missing. Joan explained that around February time, this bottle cracked when she was sterilising it, and so it had been thrown out. When asked about whether she had been struggling to cope with her children, Joan agreed that they were a bit of a handful. The time that Malathian takes to affect the body meant that the children would have had to take it within a few hours of them falling ill. As pointed out by officers, Joan was alone with the children from around 7.45am when Robert left to go to work. With this in mind, and with Joan's agreement that the children couldn't have got the Malathian themselves, police interrogated Joan as to how the insecticide could have got into the children's bodies if it was not administered by her. Joan was unable to provide an explanation. She simply said, I can't think of anything else, only to say I gave it them, but I didn't. Police returned to the topic of Joan's actions when she realised her children were ill. Joan explained that instead of taking Gillian with her, she thought she would get help quicker if she left the baby in her cot. It was a 10 minute walk to the phone box, but Joan feared that it would be in use. She also did not hear or see her neighbour Mrs Jackson and so assumed that she had gone shopping. It was at this point that she decided to go to her grandmother's on Lindsay Avenue as her gran was a nurse. Joan told police that she already thought that Stephen was dead at this point, as he was cold, before she left the house. Now I want to make a point here. Joan, it'll be, we'll discuss it later, but Joan's IQ was placed at 81, which is in the dull normal range. And I wonder if that, coupled with any difficulty she experienced through her mental illness, might have meant that common sense i.e. going and knocking on her neighbour's door, for example, to confirm she wasn't in, maybe was a bit clouded? I'm not sure. I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. In the interview, police questioned how it was that she got to her grandmother's house. Joan explained that she caught the 11C bus to Horseside Lane and got off there before getting the 26 to the depot. This journey took approximately 20 minutes. Interestingly, on her journey, Joan had passed a clinic without going in and seeking their assistance. Her explanation of this was that she had forgotten it was Friday, clinic day, at the time. Again, this links back to my earlier point about Joan's common sense. 
the course of action that she takes is not what I think an average person might do. Don't forget, she's making this journey to go to her grandmother's to ask what she should do next as she wasn't sure. We've seen this before um, when a neighbour had to tell her to ring the doctor when Stephen had hurt himself. Joan estimated that the whole journey to her grandmother's took her 45 minutes. 45 minutes is an incredibly long time when you think your child is at home, dying or even dead. You've also left your youngest unattended. When pressed again by police, Joan made the following comment, quote, No, sir, it's just, I don't know. It looks black. The picture's painted black. I am the only one in the house. The babies have got this stuff in their bodies. The only way I can say that is, I did it. It looks that way. Joan's solicitor, Mr Jackson, interrupted during the interview, saying that Joan had informed him that she had been taking tablets prescribed by the doctor because of head buzzing and was unable to control herself. When asked about whether she had suffered blackouts, Mr Jackson explained that Joan's account in private consultation agreed with the account she had given in interview. I'd just like to pause there. Um, nowadays, any instructions given in private consultation during a, a police interview, what happens is you, um, your solicitor will get the disclosure, you will have a private consultation with your solicitor and then you will decide how best to proceed an interview, and then you will go into that interview. Anything said in the private consultation between client and solicitor is now protected by client confidentiality. So no disclosures like that would be made nowadays. When pressed by police, Mr Jackson said that he had contacted the clinic nurse who informed him that Mrs Myron was very fond of her children and took them to the clinic regularly. She also deposited money into accounts in her children's names. When asked what she had done the night before, Joan recalled that on Thursday she had got the children up and dressed them. She left to get her grandmother's pension between 9.50 and 10.30 a.m. She made food for the children, had lunch with her grandmother and then went into town. She put money into her own bank account and that of her husband's. She brought some shopping back for her grandmother and then they had dinner. She washed and changed the children and left her grandmother's no later than 7 p.m., so that when her husband came in at 9pm, dinner would be ready. At the end of the interview, Joan denied any involvement in her children's deaths, but accepted that there was no one else in the house. The interview concluded at 4.35pm. According to a medical report on the mental condition of Joan Myring, dated the 13th of January 1967, she had been suffering with chronic schizophrenia, which substantially impaired her powers of feeling, striving and thinking. The report explained that there was also evidence of delusions of persecution. It went on, quote, She has shown by her actions that she is subject to unpredictable violent impulses. Her responsibility for these actions is diminished. According to a second medical report dated the 25th of January 1967, at the time of the offence her condition had regressed, and at that time she was the subject of delusional ideas about her husband and her neighbours and was undoubtedly depressed. The report put her IQ at 81, which was in the dull, normal range. The report concluded that at the relevant time, Joan was suffering from such abnormality of mind as substantially to impair her mental responsibility for her acts and omissions in doing the killings. Once Joan had been arraigned, that is, had the charges put to her in court, she was given the opportunity to say anything she wanted in answer to the charges. To both murder charges, Joan responded, and I quote, not guilty to human sin. Joan was sentenced to be detained at Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire as a person suffering from mental illness, to be subject to the special restrictions of Section 65 of the Mental Health Act without a limit of time. And that ends today's episode. I try to find out what happened to Joan after her admission to Broadmoor, but unfortunately I couldn't find any further information. If any of you listening know what happened to her, I would be very grateful if you could let me know. Um, I just wondered if she was still married, if she was forced to um, sort of stay at Broadmoor for the rest of her life, whether she went to another hospital or whether she was allowed out eventually. I can be contacted on Twitter or Instagram. 
Now, before we end, I haven't wanted to focus on the virus, but I just wanted to extend a huge thank you to all the key workers. And I've listed a few, but I know there's so many more out there. Um, so a big thank you to doctors, nurses, carers, social workers, shop workers, waste disposal workers, funeral directors, charity workers, and everybody else who is supporting the nation during these unprecedented times. Um, teachers and teaching staff are doing an incredible job as well in teaching the children um, of key workers. So I hope that you have um, enjoyed this first episode of the Students' Verdict podcast. If you did, please leave a comment and subscribe. And remember to keep living the dream.